Good morning, church. We're glad you're here this morning. We hope you find it easy and edifying to worship with us. Uh, We're doing things a little bit different this morning. There's going to be a lot of people coming up and reading scriptures and prayers, and and the song service is all uh, united around a theme that Jacob is going to uh, start us off here in just a minute on it. Before we get started in, in praise, I just want to offer up a prayer for this worship service. So if you would, please bow. Heavenly Lord, we come before you now just to worship you, to honor you, to feel the fellowship of one another, the unity of your spirit. Lord, as we sing praise to you and we study your name and your will, help it change our hearts. Help it to mold us and transform us into the glory of your son be with us now in jesus name amen well good morning um today we're going to be talking about unity and in our history in churches of christ coming from the restoration movement heritage this was a uh, a key principle in the beginnings of the restoration movement in fact barton stone was one of the leaders of the restoration movement he said let unity be our polar star let it be our guiding principle, basically the whole movement. Sadly, though, as we all know, we are not immune to division in, uh, in, in this movement, and uh, we've seen quite our share of it over the years. Barton Stone uh, identified three types of unity that are doomed to fail. One, he said, was, was book unity, and that's what he, he said, unifying around a creed, basically putting a creed down on paper and everybody signing off on it. He said, that never works. And it's only, it only really causes more division. The next one he said was head union. And head unions where we basically all agree with each other on a set of, of, of interpretations of the scriptures. And uh, then a, the third one he said was water union, which is basically just uh, is, is to say that anybody who's immersed would then be, uh, would be, we'd be in unity with. He says these are doomed, all three are doomed to fail, and the one that we most commonly have relied on in our history, I think you would see, is head union. If we all just go to the Bible and just read it, and and we can agree together to be in unity. Our dirty little secret, though, is the part that we don't always say explicitly, and it's as long as you agree with all of my conclusions on the things that I think are most important. And then from there, we divide because we don't all agree. (laughs) with each other all the time, right? Stone then identified the unity model that he said was the only one that was lasting. He called it fire union. But that really is the unity that comes by having the Holy Spirit indwelling dwelling all of us and displaying the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. That's the only kind of unity that lasts. And the thing about it is, it doesn't depend on us. It depends on the spirit that lives in us. In 1844, Stone wrote, we have been too long engaged with defending ourselves rather than the truth as it is seen in Jesus. Let us trust our little selves with the Lord and rest not until by faith in the promised spirit and by incessant prayer, we receive and be filled with it like they were of old in the ancient order of things. You know, unity was very important to Jesus. John 17, his prayer there, he pleads for the unity of those those who had followed him and those who would follow him in the future. And then in Proverbs 6, disunity is mentioned as one of those things that God really doesn't have a stump. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. I can find disunity and divisiveness in all of those, Of course, that last one there is the most explicit, the one who sows discord. As we worship today, I want you to think about how you've always thought of unity. Did you promote book union, 
head union or water union, or have you perhaps discovered the blissful and serene union that comes through the Holy Spirit? Father, I pray for all who have believed and who will believe in Jesus. I pray, Father, that we can be one. As you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. And then the world will believe that you sent Jesus to save humanity. Amen. Let's stand as we worship today. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. How the ransom singers will together lift that hymn. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy, oh, what joy when we shall get all get home to glory. Rest beneath, rest beneath that heaven. Cloudless dome in heaven, in that land, in that land where, where saints will never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. In that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly blend. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Gone will be our sadness, pleasures there will never end. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Oh, what joy, oh, what joy when, when we shall get all get home to glory. Rest, rest beneath, rest beneath that, that ever cloudless that dome in heaven. In, in that land, that in that land where, where saints will never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Victory and love will be our everlasting theme. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Oh, what joy, what joy, what joy when we shall all get home to glory. Rest Stone in heaven, in, in that land, in that land, in that land where saints will never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Yeah. 
your Son, and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. You, you may sit for our last one before communion. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here this morning, and it's a good thing to see all of you. And I heart, certainly hope we get to see all of you even more in the next little while. I have a few things I want to say this morning, and I'm going to try my best not to make a short story long, though I have been known to do that. Keith said he doesn't have much to say today, so it doesn't matter how long I go. My father is 96 years old, soon to be 97. That's a good long, long life. At this stage, he has outlived all but one of more than 60 cousins on his father's side of the family. And he has outlived all but one of more than 50 cousins on his mother's side of the family. I think his goal is to be the last man standing, but we won't go there right now. He has given so much to all of us in his life. There's this thing, that's, there's an old saw that says, when a man or a woman is young and single, they have and can claim all the rights within legal bounds that they want. When you get married, you give up a lot of those rights. And when you have your first kid, you give up the rest of them. My father got married rather young, after the Navy, and had six kids. I was the first. And by the time the sixth one came along, my father really had given up, I'll say sacrificed a lot. He didn't get to travel the world like he might have wanted. He didn't get to even see all of the state of Arkansas that he might have wanted because he gave up so very much to raise his family and to love his wife. And we can all look at that and try to do it. Now, those kind of sacrifices have meant a lot to the six of us kids, of course, and to all the grandkids, I suppose. And when he dies, if in fact he ever does, when he dies, his life is going to be worth remembering. The party we may have, the gathering we may have, won't be a special, it won't be a, a lavish feast, but we'll sit and remember my father with a big cast iron pot of pinto beans and ham and honey sweet cornbread. Jesus of Nazareth, son of David, son of God, lived just over a third of that time. He had no wife. He had no children. He had friends and disciples, followers. But he had friends. He had siblings, not all of whom really thought he was all there. He, we don't know when exactly Jesus knew, understood, learned who he was, where he had come from, and what he was here for. We don't know exactly when he figured that out. But we know it. By faith and by learning, we know it. Where he came from, why he came, and what he came for. And with all of that, with the sacrifices that he made in his life to the end, deserve remembering. I heard an old preacher say one time, and I'll try to quote it. 
I'm not going to go getting all scriptural on you right now because, folks, it's real simple. He gave it up so I could have it. He died so I could live. Now let's get about remembering it. Pray with me, please. Father God, Holy Father, for the life lived, for the body broken, for the blood shed, for the sacrifice made, we thank you in his name. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to be the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I'm reading Galatians 3:27-28. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's stand as we finish worship. O oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. Tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, teach your children to stop the fighting, start uniting all as one. Let's get together. Loving forever, sanctuary for you. Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Help me stand when Be praised, may my words bring honor to your name. Here I am, just for today, live in me, have your way for my desire. When this race is run, is 
is only to hear you say well done. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be May my thoughts be praised. May my words bring honor to your name. Amen. Please be seated. See, I'm going to read from the Apostle Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. <clears throat> warn a divisive person once and then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful he is self-condemned. Thank you all to who have been a part of the worship service so far. It's been wonderful. I wanted to mention while the kids go out, hey, Crispy was the uh, soccer player of the week. So when you see Crispy, give him a round of applause. Also wanted to mention uh, May 5th, that's this coming Wednesday, we're having a, a fellowship uh, out in the backyard. Remember to bring your folding chairs, if you would, or now we have bag chairs. I'm showing my age, aren't I? Folding chairs. They used to be aluminum with webbing in them, but anyway. Uh, if you would, when you come for that, please bring your own chairs. We will be supplying uh, uh, food, and we're going to do that in a way that should meet uh, with all the sanitary needs for that. Um, also wanted to remind you, this is not just a regular fellowship, but we are going to have a tri-baby shower on that same night. So uh, please bring the gifts, and you should have that in your bulletin that was delivered to you uh, earlier this week. Um, also, May 15th, we have the outdoor work day. And Lance, where are you, brother? Remind me of the time that starts. 9 o'clock on the 15th. And I have been told that food will be provided for that also. Um, is there anything else that I have forgotten? And my boss says we're good, so we'll start the... Jimmy was shipwrecked and lived alone on a desert island for many, many years. Finally, when the rescuers came to rescue him, he was excited to show them all that he had done and built on the island. So before he left, he took him on a little tour. And as he took him on a tour, he said, now, this is my home. This is where I slept and kept my belongings. And over here, over here, you see the little shelter that I have over my fresh water supply that was so important to me. And over here, this is where I spent a lot of time. Uh, this, this is my, my, little, my little abode that, that's open air. It's just a, a little gazebo that I built so I could cook here and I could eat and be sheltered from the weather. And I could watch the, the sea as it would roll in and out. And, and over here, now this is really precious to me. This is my church. This is where I worshiped. They started to turn and go, and one of the rescuers tapped Jimmy on the shoulder. He said, Jimmy, what's that building over there? And Jimmy kind of sneered, and he said, that's the church I used to belong to. 
as long as we are human, we're hard sometimes to get along with, sometimes even ourselves. Today we start a sermon series on unity in the Spirit. I just finished a really interesting book on the subject of unity. Unity is something that seems to be very high on God's expectations for His people. Now I want you to listen to this next verse. This is John 17, 20 through 23. Jesus is praying for His disciples and for us. Listen closely. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know how the world is going to believe that Christ came to earth, was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected by our unity, by us being one. These are the words of Jesus. He continues, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, in them and in me, that they may come perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them, are you listening? And loved them even as you loved me. Do you hear the deep unity in this prayer from Jesus to God the Father? Jesus is praying for the same unity that exists between the the Trinity to be ours. Just think of that for a moment. The unity that the Trinity has experienced from the beginning of time, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Jesus is praying that that unity might be ours, Pat, that we might know that same unity. Listen, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. Jesus is asking for perfect unity in the Holy Spirit with the Trinity and with each other. Jesus' expectation is that you and I will share in the same love, humility, the same mindset, the same peace that the Trinity has shared throughout eternity. This is a huge issue for followers Of Jesus Christ so much so that disunity Paul puts disunity at the same level of idolatry fits of anger drunkenness orgies it's funny here how we prioritize sin right and we see those that I just mentioned way up there on the bad taboo list but nobody really talks about the sin of disunity right? Let's be truthful. What would be the level of shock if someone said Keith was found participating in an orgy last night at the Skylight Motel? What would be the the level of shock if the headline read, Pastor Castleman bashes a windshield of a woman who cut him off at MLK and Razorback Road out of a fit of rage? (laughs) Come on, let's be honest. The phone mill, gossip mill would start running at a breakneck speed. AT&T would have to put in new lines and new cell towers just to handle the load, right? But what if, what if it was Brother X leaves the church because he didn't believe someone at church the way they believed or Brother X left the church because somebody made him mad. Would that get the phone ringing? Would that make the headlines? 
I have to admit we haven't done a good job of communicating the high priority of unity and the grievous sin of division from the pulpit. Because if we had, people wouldn't be leaving churches and changing churches like they change their clothes, right? Got ahead of myself. Listen to Paul as he tells the church in the Galatian area uh, about this. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealous fits of jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like that. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Paul lists off some things here that are going to cost you your soul if you participate in them. Now, two to three of these out of the 15 are in direct, re, directly related to disunity. Dissensions, that is sedition, turning on one another so that you might gain more power than divisions, or as some translations say, fraction, uh, factions, or as Young's literal translation calls it, sex, S-E-C-T-S. The Greek word here is where we get our word, our English word for heresy. It means to break off a group for the sake of your own opinion or your own gain. Let's look at the severity of the behavior of disunity that it's listed with. It's listed with envy, drunkenness, orgies, and sorcery. I say all this because I want you to realize the severity and the sin of participating in disunity and the high expectations that Christ calls us to be in unity. All right, so this is your part of your practice. This is part of your active part of the sermon. I want you to look over at the person next to you and say, do you realize how important it is that you and I have unity? But you will before this sermon's over, brother. Our problem is, our problem with unity are typically not caused by our doctrinal differences, but they're caused by the shallowness of our love. If we loved like God loved us, we wouldn't have divisions in the church. Listen to John, the apostle of love. John was known for being the apostle who God loved. And then John writes his last three letters, and, and you, he can't go more than, than ten words without using the word love. He says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God, what church? God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. If we practice the kind of love that has been shown to us by God, we'd stop dividing churches. We would stop leaving one family of God for another over petty differences. God's intention is is that we treat one another like family. Jesus says, whoever does the will of the Father is my brother, is my sister, is my mother. On the cross, Jesus leaves his mother, Mary, to the apostle that he loved. It was the tradition to leave your mother, if you were going to die, if you died, 
then you are to be taken care of by your oldest son. But Jesus doesn't do that. He leaves his mother to the apostle that he had the greatest unity with, and that was John. The example is clear, church. We are to have the same type of deep relationships in our church with one another as we have in our family. Can I get an amen? When we're deeply in love, division is unthinkable. When we are deeply in love, division is unthinkable. What if I told you? Now, this is just a what if. This is not reality. I just, but go there with me, okay? What if I told you Anna and I can't agree upon the form of corporate worship on Sunday mornings? Because I want a guitar accompaniment up here on the stage. And she just can't stand that. Now, she can't give me a chapter or verse why it's wrong, but she's just absolutely sure that she's right. She feels very strongly about this. And in no way, shape, or form is she going to participate in a worship where there's an instrument involved. I, on the other hand, I feel very strongly that we should take communion out of one cup the way Jesus did. You thought wearing a mask was hard to have unity in? One cup. I see no examples, no necessary inferences or deductive implications that would lead us to believe that there's any other way to take the fruit of the vine other than one cup. That's the way we see Jesus doing it. But Anna, with her undergrad in microbiology and her master's degree in medical technology and her experience in infectious diseases in the lab, says there ain't no way she's drinking out of a cup with a hundred of you. <laughs> if you're online and can't hear that, there's getting a lot of amens there. Now, what if I told you Anna was going to leave me over that? What if I told you that she was going to take the two younger kids because she figures I still have time to mess them up, and she's going to take them, and she's going to go to Bolivia, and she's going to get the car and all the money in the bank, and she's going off to Bolivia because she can't stand to be with me. What if I, what would you tell me if I said I was going to leave her because of this? Now, I know what some of you would say to me, or to her, excuse me. Some of you would instantly go to her and go, I don't know how you stand that man anyway. <laughs> but really, what would you say to her? You'd probably say, Anna, don't you love Keith? Isn't he an integral, indispensable part of your life? What would you come and tell me? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you come to me and say, Keith, this is outrageous. Can't you meet her needs to stay in the marriage? If you were really smart, you'd look at both of us and you'd say, don't you value your mutual love and your marital union more than you do your need to be right? Is it really that what it's all about? Don't you love more than you need to be right? Truth is, church, we divide easily because we love shallowly. If we love deeply like Christ has loved us, we would never split over things like kitchens in the church, supporting missionary societies, praise teams, divided Bible classes, supporting orphan homes outside of the church, and paying, 
paying for the church out of the church's budget. Yes, our tribe of Rep- Reformationists have all split over these things. We divide easily, church, because we love shallowly. We should value unity more than our need to be right. At this point, some people, maybe in the back of their mind, is thinking, oh, well, Keith has gone soft on doctrine. And I tell you, no, I haven't. I believe there is meaningless talk. I believe there is heresy. I believe there are serious matters. And we're going to talk about those in the future in this sermon series. We'll talk about in the weeks to come, Lord willing, we'll talk about the spirit of unity, having the same mind, the need for humility, and being peaceable with one another, with the rest of the world, and how that relates to unity. However, this morning, I just want to ask you, have you been a part of of divisiveness have you caused disunity in your life has your need to be right outweighed your need to love are you actively right now in your life participating in divisiveness because if you are I want you to see and understand how damaging and how grievous that behavior is to God. I also want you to understand that there is forgiveness. God sits on the throne room waiting for your words of repentance, desiring to forgive you and to heal your brokenness. He desires unity with you, the same unity that he has shared with the Trinity from the beginning of time. Our elders, can I have our elders stand just for a minute so you can see who they are? Because sometimes not everybody knows. Our elders would love to meet with you, to pray with you, so that, that you might come to a closer union with your Lord. If you would, please stand with me. If you would, go along with me as we read this doxology together, this praise to God. And then, Kent, you'll dismiss us in prayer. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the day that you've given us. We thank you for the time we've spent in worship this morning. We've enjoyed the fellowship with each other and spending time in your presence. Lord, we pray for the families who have lost loved ones recently. Give them comfort and peace. We pray for the sick that are fighting health issues. Give them strength to keep fighting and know that they're in our daily prayers. Lord, we pray for this church to continue to grow. We pray for unity in spirit and showing love to each other. Lord, we bless our leaders at this church and their families. Help them to uh, guide us in the right path. Lord, as we go, as we get ready to go back home, we ask you to continue to be with us. Help us to remain faithful to you in everything we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.